I'm going to be reading from Exodus 1, 1 through 7. These are the names of the son of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his own household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Ishkar, Zebulon, and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, Don, for reading our sermon text for today. If you would, please bow your heads with me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Would you speak to us this morning? We ask in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. As I mentioned earlier in the worship service today, Uh, We are starting a new sermon series uh, through the book of Exodus, and initially we're going to be studying chapters 1 through 18, and we'll, uh, there's kind of three main sections to Exodus, that's section 1, we'll do that together, and then we might pick up the others, Uh, we will pick them up at a a later time, but uh, I'm excited, Uh, Exodus, why Exodus? It's the second book of the Bible, uh, in that group of five books at the beginning of the Bible that are sometimes referred to as the Pentateuch, that is the five books. Uh, Sometimes we call that section Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We call that the law in shorthand, or the Hebrew word for that, the Torah. And it's the book of Exodus, its events are depicted in some of the most iconic films of all time, right? You think back, if you're a little older in the room, you might have grown up watching Charlton Heston, right? Uh, uh, And the Ten Commandments. All right, clocking in at three and a half hours, complete with an intermission. And it airs ever since 1973. That has aired every year around Easter time on ABC. So, I mean, every, there's a lot of people who've seen that. Or maybe you're like me. I was talking to Austin earlier. He affirmed this is, he's in this boat as well. Uh, you grew up watching the animated film, The Prince of Egypt. And it has voice talent such as Val Kilmer, Michelle Pfeiffer, Sandra Bullock. Steve Martin and Martin Short in it, okay? A lot of people. The soundtrack, I've, told, I've talked about this before. Whitney Houston and Mariah Carey in one song. I mean, how great is that? And I think it's interesting. It's made by DreamWorks Animation, came out in 1998, and it is the first movie that they produced. DreamWorks would go on to create franchises like Shrek, How to Train Your Dragon, uh, uh, the Kung Fu Pandas franchise, but the first film that they produced was one with the story of the Exodus. How interesting. And it still lingers in film today. And as recently as 2014, a major motion picture directed by Ridley Scott and uh, starring Christian Bale came out, The Dark Knight himself, called Exodus, Gods, and Kings. So suffice it to say, this story continues to capture the imagination of Christians, of Jews, and even of atheists like Ridley Scott. Right? And, but the thing is, we're not here to study Exodus merely because it's a cultural artifact, right? And that it's an influential document. We could do that. That's a, that, there's a lot of influential things we could read and study together. It'd be worth our time. But the reason we're studying Exodus is because it's God's word. Now, I do think that we have to understand, when, whenever you talk to your non-Christian neighbor about Christianity, maybe they've never grown up in church before, and it's a foreign world to them. Right? All they may know about Christianity is about, that it's about some guy named Jesus who in their minds was a moral teacher. Maybe he died on a cross and they might know about the resurrection, but they may not know anything else about the Bible except they might know about the Exodus. Again, because of the films that I mentioned a moment ago, it might actually be we have evangelistic interest because that might be a common point we can talk about. Except we have more reasons to study this book. And it goes even to Jesus himself. I could list a lot of reasons, but I'm going to just give you one more. Uh, A particular interest is the transfiguration, which we read about earlier in Luke chapter 9. 
Uh, there are some things that we can make very clear connections to the book of Exodus. First, whenever Jesus was transfigured, who was with him? Elijah and Moses. So Moses is there. He's on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. The second is that the event of the transfiguration is the revealing, the pulling back of Jesus' divine glory. And it's uh, in which it's a, it's a glory that he shares with the Father and the Spirit. And of all the places for this to take place, it happens on a mountain. Well, this is very similar to the book of Exodus in chapter 19, whenever the people of Israel are at the foot of Mount Sinai, having been delivered from Egypt, they have an encounter with God. And it says in chapter 19, verse 18, it says, Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. We're told there was thunder and lightning when the glory of the Lord dwelt there. The people of Israel had to make themselves holy before they even stood at the foot of the mountain because of God's intense holiness, the holiness of his glory. Third, another connection here is that the Father's voice, which we hear in Luke chapter 9, it commends the disciples in Luke chapter 9, 35. It says, a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. Well, on Mount Sinai, God gave Israel the law. The people were to listen to God, to receive instruction, just as we receive instructions from Jesus But I want us to look at one more place in this passage, and it's in verse 31, Luke chapter 9, verse 31. It says that uh, he appeared with Moses and Elijah, who appeared to him in glory, and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. And I want us to focus on that word, departure, because if you're reading through in the Greek, it's unmistakable. The word there in the Greek is exodus. They were talking to Jesus about his departure. Exodus, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. We might ask, what exodus, what departure would Jesus accomplish at Jerusalem? Well, his death upon the cross, his resurrection, that would accomplish our redemption. So I don't think it's any accident that that's what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. I don't think it's any accident that the gospel writer Luke wrote, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote it just that way, so that we would see these connections to the book of Exodus. Right, the book, the event of the Exodus is the preeminent act of salvation in the Bible short of the cross of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. The book, the act of the Exodus of delivering God's people from Egypt is the preeminent act of salvation in the entire Bible short of the cross of Jesus Christ. And again, it gives meaning to the cross. That's how one of the ways in which we understand it is in terms of redemption. So studying the book of Exodus will ultimately help us understand the death and resurrection of Jesus and what it has accomplished for us. And this is just one example. As we look at the transfiguration, it's only one example of hundreds, if not thousands of examples across the entire Bible, something that Andrew Wilson and Alistair Roberts have termed echoes of Exodus. Echoes of Exodus. If you read the Exodus story and you keep reading onward, you keep hearing these faint echoes throughout the story of things that, oh, that sounds just like what happened in the book of Exodus, meaning that we must pay close attention. And so today, as we begin at the beginning, in Exodus chapter 1, verses 1 to 7, which Don read, I want us to listen to this text together to get a sense of what God had done and is doing. And today, I hope you'll see this, that God is always in the process of moving creation towards new creation by bringing his people to his place in his timing, which fulfills his promises. Let me say that one more time. God is always in the process of moving creation to new creation by bringing his people to his place and his timing, which fulfills his promises. As we start today, I really want to begin by looking at the first word in the book of Exodus in the Hebrew, which is a little different than our English translations. If you've, most English translations, including the English Standard Version, uh, start off with this word, which is the Hebrew letters. These are the names, and that's actually the Hebrew title of the book of Exodus. These are the names. But there's one extra little particle in there in the Hebrew, one little extra piece before that, and it's the word and. The King James Version and the New American Standard kind of translate that now. Now these are the names of uh, the sons of Jacob. But in the Hebrew, it's the word and. And what, you know, you're saying, Ryan, 
why, what, what, why does the conjunction matter? You know, are we, back, are we going back to second grade grammar class? Let me illustrate. And the three bears came home from the woods, and they came to their table. Papa bear said, someone has taken a bite out of my porridge. Mama bear said, someone's taken a bite out of my porridge. And baby bear said, someone has eaten all of my porridge. You notice the way that I started that story? And the three little bears came home. Well, there's an and there because it tells us that we're in the middle of a story that's already ongoing. What happened before that? Well, they went out to play in the woods, and Goldilocks showed up. She was hungry, so she ate Pop, Papa Bear's porridge. It was too hot. Mama Bear's porridge, too cold. Baby Bear's porridge, just right. Ate the whole bowl. Went to sit in the chairs. Papa Bear's chair, too hard. Mama Bear's chair, too soft. Baby chairs, Baby Bear's chair, just perfect. Well, then she broke it. She got scared, ran upstairs. She was getting sleepy, found the bed. Papa Bear's bed, too hard. Mama Bear's bed, too lumpy. Baby Bear's bed, just right. So she takes a nap. And then the three little bears came home. We need to know what happened beforehand. And I think that the book of Exodus starts with and to make us reflect back on what's happened beforehand in the book of Genesis. It doesn't stand alone, but rather it's a continuation of God's story and God's work with his people. We'll see that overlap today. Well, in the first part of the book of Exodus, it opens, us telling, it opens up telling us about the same family from Genesis 1 from the book of Genesis, about the same family. Uh, look at Exodus 1, verses 1 to 5, or 1 to 4. It says, These are the names of the sons of Israel when they, who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. It helps us already think about how we got where we are. Uh, the family of Jacob came down from the land of Canaan. And how did this happen? Well, who is Jacob in Genesis? Remember, he is the grandson of Abraham, and God gave him 12 sons. His youngest son, Joseph, was kind of kidnapped by his brothers and sold off into slavery, and eventually he, found, he wound up in Egypt. After many years of serving as a slave and a brief stint in prison due to a false accusation, he emerged as one of the highest-ranking bureaucrats in the land of Egypt. If you ever want a bad talky bureaucrat, I understand the impulse, but do remember that God can work through them. Just let's just remember that together. He's a high-ranking bureaucrat, and God uses him in his position to avert a devastating famine in the land of Egypt. He knows, he gets a, Pharaoh receives a dream, Joseph interprets that, that in seven years, there's going to be seven years of famine. So he leads Egypt to spend the next seven years stocking up on food, and not only does it provide for them, it provides for the needs of the entire region including Jacob's own family, the same one that sold him into slavery. So when his brothers come down and they eventually realize who their brother is, they go back to their father Jacob, also known as Israel. And Jacob is an older man. I don't know exactly how old he was, but we can probably assume in his 80s, 90s, maybe even older I, and it might not be a surprise to you, but he wasn't that eager to move. <laughs> uh, I've lived my whole life here. Why? I've, I've been all around. I'm really old. Why would I pick up and move my family from Canaan all the way down, hundreds of miles away to Egypt in an era before moving vans, before trains, before airplanes? How are we going to get there? Well, God gave him a vision. In Genesis 46, verses 1 through 6, it says, So Israel, that is Jacob, he took his journey. With all that he had, he came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, he said, here I am. And then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Don't be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again. And Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. They also took their livestock and their goods, which they'd gained in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt, Jacob and all his offspring with him. Once Jacob's entire family moves to Egypt, he passes away. He dies. But the family grows and they stay strong, right? These 12 sons become 12 clans within a larger family. And, you know, this growing family, it harkens back not simply to the promises to Jacob or his father Isaac, but really all the way back to Abraham. Right, when God called an older couple again, 
Abraham and Sarah, he was 75, she was 65, well beyond childbearing years. And again, he called them to move. And he promised them, I'm going to make you into a great nation. And then after he, you know, promised this childless couple with a barren wife that this would happen, 25 years later, it happens. I think this is a reminder for us that sometimes God's timing is not exactly our timing, is it? Right, if I make you a promise, you probably think he's got a time span of hours, days, perhaps weeks and months, and only for the most very special promises, years, that he would fulfill this. But God takes 25 years. And what God is, is he's faithful to Abraham until Abraham learns to be faithful to him. Remember, God is operating on the scale of eternity. And so 25 years might seem like a long time to us, but in the scale of God, it's not, uh, not forever. We're reminded of this family history. He's, Abraham gives birth to Isaac, who gives birth to Jacob. Jacob is a squirrely fellow. He cheats his family, runs away, but he is given 12 sons by the Lord. God continually working through barren women to produce these children. And God, even though there's a lot of turmoil within the family, God ultimately uses this turmoil, turmoil to save the family and to eventually save the nations. It's a family history. Yesterday, my parents were visiting, and uh, they were tell- talking to me about some recent family history they'd been doing. Right? My mom has recently come into uh, a possession of a letter from her mom, my grandmother, when she was seven years old in 1943 that she wrote to her dad. 1987, my great-grandmother, who I never had the chance to meet, wrote a letter describing what the family was like. My dad was talking to me. I learned stories I never knew, that I had a great-aunt who died at a relatively young age whenever my my dad was in middle school, and that I also have an ancestor who was in America back to the colonial founding of Connecticut in the 1600s. I didn't know this. Our family histories are important, but this family history in the Bible, the family of Abraham, is perhaps most important of all. For through this family, God would bless others. And this brings me to my second point, which is not only that we are talking about the same family from the book of Genesis, but they also have the same mission, the same mission. And it comes down to the way God chooses to work with people, that is through covenants. And I want us to look at Genesis chapter 12, uh, verses 1 to 3 for just a moment. It says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Through this family and in Genesis 15 God tells Abraham that this family, eventually his descendants would outnumber the sea of the, or the sand of the sea or the stars in the sky. That through this family, God would bless the nations. And this, we see this in Exodus 1, 5 to 6. It says, all the descendants of Jacob were 70. That's all the sons, all, the, all of his male children and grandchildren were 70. Joseph was already in Egypt. And then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. Again, this, that, that number of 70 didn't include all the women in the family, didn't include all the young, young children. And 70 is, it's not quite a nation. It's not quite a nation. But already, as I mentioned, God had used this family to bless the nation of Egypt, to help the nations. And he's a blessing. Uh, again, but when we're told that really through this promise to Abraham, God is going to take care of the problem of sin in the world. And now Exodus tells us Joseph has died. And that's, that's a significant detail because that's the very last thing we read about in the book of Genesis. But I actually want to look at what happened when his father Jacob died in Genesis chapter 49, verse 28 and following. It says, all these are the 12 tribes of Israel. That is what their father said to them as he blessed them, blessing each with the blessing suitable to him. Then he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered. This is after they've gone down to Egypt. He says, I'm to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephraim the Hittite. And the cave which is in the field of Machpelah to the east of Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is in it were bought from the Hittites. Again, whenever Jacob is 
Whenever he dies, they embalm him in, a, in, e, in Egypt. Remember, if you've studied ancient history, you know they were good at that, right? They embalmed the pharaohs. They put them in the pyramids and buried them so they, they could last thousands of years. They embalmed Jacob. It was a very uh, sign of honor. And his children take him all the way back to the land of Canaan. But why? Why would he want to do that? Is it just because the family burial plot, the cemetery plot is important? You know, what was so special about that cave in the field at Machpelah, east of Mamre? What was so special about that? I think it's because God had promised their family that land. Right? Abraham lived in faith and he died in faith. Even though God promised him a huge piece of land, he died with only a burial plot. And when Jacob is having his descendants send him back to the land of Canaan to be buried, it's because he believes in God's promise that he would give the family that land that eventually they would receive that. And eventually, whenever Joseph dies in Genesis 50, verses 24 to 26, these are the last verses in the book of Genesis, it says, Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and will bring you up out of this land that he swore to Abraham, to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. And then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you and you will carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being... 110 years old, they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. So as Exodus opens, we hear about Joseph, that he's died in his entire generation, but the family is still in Egypt, which means that we should expect a move is about to happen. Again, the, we're told later in Exodus that there's about 600,000 men of the people of Israel, and so the promise that they would have a lot of descendants, that's happening, but they're not in the land yet. And so we look forward to this mission, again, that God would give the family the land, but that they would become a nation for the sake of the other nations, right? That the blessing would be for Israelites and Egyptians, for Assyrians and Babylonians, for the Greeks and the Romans, for Chinese and for Americans. I want to ask you something. Have you ever wondered why we as Baptists care so much about missions? Right, the most famous Southern Baptist who has ever lived is not a pastor, it's not a theologian, it's not a seminary professor, but it's a missionary. Right, you know who I'm talking about, Lottie, Lottie Moon, missionary to China in the 1800s. Why, why is our most famous Southern Baptist ever a missionary? Right, why do we collect multiple offerings a year and send a portion of our, desert, our general tithes and offerings off away so that we can send missionaries around the globe? Right, uh, 10 years ago today, okay, August 1st, 2011, I came back from a two-month stint in Lima, Peru, where I was helping mission teams connect with locals so that we could reach the neighborhoods in Lima, Peru, a mega city that had 12 million people living in it. Uh, for context, that's almost twice the population of Tennessee in one mega city. Okay, why did I do that? Why would I spend a summer in college there? It's because of the Great Commission, right? what did Jesus say? Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. But why did Jesus care about that? Well, if we are reading the Bible closely and we know what God promised Abraham, then it's really no surprise that God has a plan not only for the people of Israel, his chosen and elect people, but for all the nations, all the Gentiles, right? And that Gentile is just a term that means anybody who's not from the family physically descended from Abraham. Right? It's this, and, and, and the, we're reading about the same mission in the book of Exodus. And it's not only about that same mission, but I, and this is my final point today, it's about God's ultimate mission. God's ultimate mission. Right? God is fulfilling this. Look at verse 7. It says, The people of Israel were fruitful, and they increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. Well, the family, as I mentioned, they're growing. In, in Hebrew, there are seven consecutive words talking about just how the family is almost bursting at the seams, to use the metaphor. And it's, you know, not only to just demonstrate this faithfulness to Abraham's promise, but the language that's used is actually reminiscent of something that God says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. After creating man in his image, God says, this God blessed them, that is the man and the woman, and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, 
This is sometimes known as the creation mandate, the dominion mandate. And it reminds us that the scope of God's work is not simply local, but it's universal. Remember what I said earlier, God is in the process of moving creation to new creation. By the time Israel leaves Egypt, they would number more than 600,000. And remember where it all started? With a couple of old Mesopotamian men and their barren wives. Think of a text like Isaiah chapter 45, verses 1 to 3. The prophet says, Seeing, O barren one, who did not hear, who, who did not bear, bring forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor, for the children of the desolate will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge your tent, make it bigger. Let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes, for you will spread abroad to right and to left, and your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. God makes new creation through barren wombs, and indeed he has blessed the people. But it's not just so that the descendants of Abraham can inherit everything. We know ultimately the heir of Abraham would be Jesus, who welcomes us into this international, multi, multinational, global family of people who believe in his name. But through Israel, through this one family, we see a microcosm of the macrocosmic design of God. And again, sometimes it takes a while, but we must take the long view. Right? If we believe that all of God's promises must be fulfilled in our lifetime, we're going to whip ourselves up into a frenzy, and we're going to be perpetually exhausted and disappointed because... Well, it didn't happen in time. But part of serving an eternal God is we understand that there is an intergenerational aspect of how God works through his people. Right? It's the, and it's this intergenerational time frame through which God's promises are fulfilled. It means that we have to wait upon the Lord. Right? And I think of a text like Psalm 33, verses 18 to 22. It says, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope, who wait, who long for his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and may keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits upon the Lord, for he is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him, because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Remember, the goal is not simply a plot, a plot of land in Israel, roughly the size of New Jersey, it's not making sure that our nation is the greatest, strongest, biggest nation in the world, but rather it's aiming towards God's new creation. Where all nations will bow at the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ, where he sits upon the throne and receives worship and praise and honor from all people, from every tongue, every tribe, every people, and every nation. And the three little bears came home. Remember, there is more that happens in that story, right? They find their porridge eaten. They find their chair broken. They find someone sleeping in one of their beds. There's more that comes afterwards. And there are many things awaiting us in the book of Exodus. And I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, spending this time with us as a church. But again, as, remember what I said at the beginning of the sermon. The Exodus is the paradigmatic act of salvation in the Bible, and it really gives us an understanding of what the word redemption means. To be delivered from bondage. To be saved by God. And ultimately, this is why Jesus goes to the cross. It points us to the cross of Jesus Christ where he redeems us from sin, death, and hell. In order that we might be servants of God. Indeed, I think the best and really the only way that we can understand the Exodus rightly is by understanding it through the lens of of Jesus Christ by trusting him by faith to coming unto him. And so I want to just say something today. If you've never believed in Jesus Christ, today I would encourage you to do so. I'm going to be standing down front in just a minute. And I'd love to pray with anyone. If there's any burden you might have you need to pray about. If you feel like you are in need of deliverance or if you know someone who needs redemption and you would like to pray, I want to pray with them. If you feel like you need that today. Uh, if you would like to talk about what it means to serve at this church, I'll be here. I'd like to talk to anybody.
But I want us to think about the deliverance that we have in Jesus Christ, God's Son, who though he was made who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be taken advantage of, but rather emptying himself and being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So I'd like to... I want, us, I want that to be us today. I want us to be a part of God's people as we journey with him onwards to redemption to the place that he has prepared for us. If you would, please bow your heads with me and let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the way in which you have been faithful to your promises. In our own lifetime, God, you have walked with us as a church family and even individually in our lives. I know there are people who have suffered much in their lives, and yet you have always been faithful. God, every time we have sinned, every time we have wronged someone else and sinned against you, God, you have offered forgiveness because of your steadfast love and faithfulness. And so, Father, as we think about the Exodus, as we look forward to redemption, Father, I pray that you would begin now to work in our hearts, work in our minds, to transform our understanding. Father, that we would, uh, again, be able to take the book of Exodus beyond simply these cinematic adaptations that we enjoy with our families, but rather that we would hear it as the living word of God that is sharper than a two-edged sword. God, as we uh, take this journey, I pray that you would work in us as a church, that you would convict us of our sin. God, that you would help us to glory in your salvation and in who you are. And that you would show us how we might be faithful servants of you and of your son Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. God, I pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen.